Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thanks for coming to the last <laughs> slot of the day. <laughs> um, we'll forgive anyone that uh, snoozes, snores during the presentation. I understand, I've been there before. Um, I'm just going to get uh, Aaron started here. So I'm uh, Zal, I'm founder of uh, Romanet. We're just one of the many software companies that Aaron uh, has spent his, a good chunk of his life trying to glue together with input and output data. So that's really what the presentation is about today. Um, real world experience um, and you know, really the aim of looking at the data center life cycle, all of the tools that are involved, well, maybe not all, but a good chunk of the tools that are involved in that life cycle, getting data in and out of those tools and, and trying to get us to a better place and for folks like Aaron not to have to re-key things a hundred times. So I'm going to pass over to Aaron and uh, take it from there. All right, thanks all. So I'm going to talk really fast because I have a lot of information to cover. Um, and so, like Zell said, my life is spent basically piecing together lots of different tools through the life of a building and getting that data flow to be able to use it for design construction analysis. Anything from creating bills of materials to doing energy analytics to CFD do what we can to make them as efficient as possible and to utilize them as best that we can. This is a chart from Autodesk that they like to show to represent basically the value of the facility documentation associated through the life of a building, but also it represents nicely the flow of data that is lost as you go from one, one phase to another and from one design team to another. So how many people here are on the owner side or represent the owner? Sweet, we got one <laughs> or two, all right. So basically, those losses end up being significant financial losses to you guys, either from an operational standpoint of view or from construction delays or mistakes. This graphic represents all the different engineering surfaces that I get to play in, trying to fix a lot of those issues. So each one of the circles represents, like I said, different engineering, or different engineering surface from IT, infrastructure, electrical, mechanical and plumbing design, to construction documentation, to facility asset management and tracking, and then, and then our bread and butter, energy analysis, CFD modeling, specifications, who everybody loves, code compliance, BMS controls, as-built measurement and verification, and then my personal favorite now is virtual reality. Each of the lines represents that flow of data between those different engineering services. The thickness of the line represents the value associated with that flow of data. Before starting this investigation, the vast majority of the, the flow was manual. So you have to go through and manually enter in most of the information. All these different services and all these different models and, and analysis are done in silos. So they take up a lot of time and, they're, and it's generally, and a lot of mistakes are made. That's the ones represented in red. The, the ones represented in gray are basically non-existent. Up until recently, we don't use VR. As-built measurement and verification gets done, but not enough and not done well. And so, for all intents and purposes, it just doesn't really happen. We're not going to talk about all of them, but we'll talk about most of them. Facility asset management, or facility asset management and tracking and co-compliance is important, but we ran out of time. So, again, not going to read everything that's up here, but these are all the different tools that we've, we went through and tested through this investigation to see what we were able to do. We use two different pilot projects. We have one from Rahi Systems, their mini DC for its simplicity. And then we also took the BIM models associated with one of my favorite hyperscale clients um, and their large data center. And so we took that, gutted it, and used it to be able to experiment with to see what we could do on such a, such a large scale. To start, we looked at Taco uh, HVAC's Solutions Pro. So this is used for mechanical design, and then also we're doing the single line diagrams and the control diagrams associated with it. From there, we're able to create point list, and then we're able to link this into Revit through their plugin, so you can pass information to the families associated with your BIM model to be able to utilize that data. This is the, the, um, the hyperscale data center in Revit. I'm not gonna to talk too much about Revit itself because I'm sure you guys are familiar with it as it's an industry standard. But what you guys may not know is that you're able to link your specifications and your standards to that model if you use assembly codes for it. So you can build out a template of what you would have in your model so you don't have to write those out continuously every single time. 
And if you wanted to get really fancy, you could actually add, you can add the impact of being able to look at specific shared parameters within those families to be able to detail those, um, those specifications even more. <clears throat> You're also able to use another plugin from David Rushforth to export all the data that's in the database behind BIM, the, the BIM model into Excel so you can use it for things like, again, bills and materials or to pull into other tools for analysis. Next, we looked at the uh, Matterport's 3D scanner um, to be able to produce virtual tours of your, of your data centers. Um, nobody would let me do a high definition um, virtual uh, point cloud of their interior data center to share it to the public. So just use a rather large um, mechanical room from Elite CADs that they scanned in. So this scanner, you go through in each of the circles, you place the scanner down and it does a scan for you. There's no like targets that you have to, to line up to, to make it work. The guys at Matterport do the post-processing afterwards for you. And you're able to create these virtual tours to which when you're doing your, me your um, <clears throat> measurement verification for your as built to reference it. Not only can you do a virtual tour, but it also creates a 3D point cloud that you're able to use Recap in order to pull into to Revit. Once you have it into Revit, you're able to trace on top of it or take the ASBIT models that were used, that your consultants used to verify, you know, are they, are they accurate? And this is much, much faster than having to go through and manually measure stuff out yourself and be able to, and then, and then digest that into Revit. Next, we're going to talk about CFD modeling, specifically Future Facilities Six Sigma DCX. Um, they have the ability to be able to pull in equipment through CSV files into their tool, so you can look at the installation or what you have on your, your floor. You can also, if you have information associated with specific um, equipment that may not be in their library already, you can also use that and import the data through CSV files. And so, and, and from, um, from Six Sigma, there's also a lot of information that you can export out to other tools too. So again, they use a XML file that's compatible with uh, Excel spreadsheets. So you can put information with the airflows, each of the different pieces of equipment, um, just about any piece of, uh, of the model that you're doing, you're gonna be able to export information from it to Excel that you can then link to other tools for, for analysis or to make it so you don't have to re-enter that same information again elsewhere. So now, I want to turn it over to Zal, because he is the expert about Romo, Romanet uh, analytics, and he's going to talk, oops. And he's going to talk about, you know, what we're able to do with, with Romanet. Thanks, Aaron. Um, which one? Yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> as, uh, as Aaron's been trying to explain here, one of the challenges with all these dif different tools is the data exchange between them. So, uh, a lot of the tools that Aaron's used will have some sort of import from CSV, some sort of export to CSV, but CSV is a very rudimentary, crude way of getting data in and out of a system, particularly if you, if you want to start doing anything, not necessarily in real time, but in any large scale data sets. And that's where we've had a challenge because what we do is we take um, essentially data from instrumentation systems on site and we post process that on an analytics platform and compare it with the model. So the data sets are pretty large. Um, what we'd like to be able to do again is start pulling information from the other spatial tools out there. So our particular application is all around energy and energy based with a financial element to it, but we don't maintain any spatial. So if you look at things like CFD, um, uh, uh, there would be a much bigger benefit to the, the end users and the operators of, of these facilities and the systems in there um, and maintaining that environment, again, if there were ways to bridge the information on a more automated basis between these platforms. Um, so just very quickly, a little bit about this uh, particular application. So this is the Romanet Analytics platform. Um, and again, what it's doing is it's taking a, essentially a predictive model uh, of the facility and the equipment within there, the design specifications, sequence of operations, control strategy, all the elements that affect data center performance. Um, and then it goes ahead and pulls uh, information post having collected that through uh, BMS monitoring, EPMS systems, DCIM systems, whatever those systems are. And then it continuously compares them with the, the predictive model and essentially provides a delta analysis. So if I 
I don't know if I can pause this, but if you look at the top part, the orange part of that graph, that's uh, some of the actual data from the instrumentation. And the top of the filled area of the graph is the expected. So we're able to see and track performance deltas at a building level, at a subsystem level, at a system level, and a component level, which when you look at the types of data centers folks are operating today, they're getting more and more highly instrumented. Um, the ability to actually understand what the issues are underlying that may suddenly raise up many hundreds of um, alarms and alerts at the top um, is really quite complicated. So this provides an ability to, to actually see when I get 15, 20, maybe 150 alarms at a top level system due to a, a component uh, moving off design spec or having a fault condition further down, um, how, do I, how do I remove uh, and eliminate the noise and get to the, the true signal um, underneath. But again, this, this presentation is, is more so about um, the data exchange between that. There's um, a discussion going on at the moment about um, trying to get to a standard XML, open XML format, um, both around the static information uh, that goes in here around design performance specs, so an XML schema that you can describe a piece of equipment whether that piece of equipment's an IT device or whether it's a chiller or a compressor, doesn't really matter, but how you describe the performance of that device in a, in a machine readable format and a format with a common schema that you can data exchange with, with other applications. Um, and then how you can go on from there to take the, the real time information. And I know there are a couple of folks in this room that are passionate about trying to A, disaggregate the software from the hardware um, side of the platform, but also enable data exchange across the whole, uh, the, the whole stack in the data center. So from an application level to an IT systems, IT systems management monitoring uh, down into building management. I mean, really, there's a very good white paper written years ago by Google called the warehouse size computer. You know, really these facilities should be managed overall essentially as a single unit, not with all the very separate at the moment control systems and many of them being proprietary and not enabling uh, the good data exchange between those in order to get um, both the system level performance that the IT and applications guys are looking for but also the, the, the data center level performance as well. So I'm um, happy to go uh, into more detail. I think the video is about to run out so I will hand back to Aaron. Thanks. All right. So the next tool we're gonna to talk about is from iTrax. And so I know DCIM is generally a dirty word in our industry, but um, these guys have actually done a pretty good job. They're able to aggregate data from all types of different sources and pull it into their tool. They, they represent everything in 3D and then they have it so you can quickly go over to 2D drawings. And then you also have uh, power chains to represent the single on diagrams associated with the, the connectivity of the equipment within your data center. What's cool is all this stuff is connected and then also it's all interactive. So you can click and get information that you need from just about anywhere within the tool. You also have the ability to, to show, well, they're showing the different racks. So this is the, the mini DC model that we use to experiment with, you know, how well does it work? And so you can look at the front of the rack and the tops. And then also they have the ability to pull in CAD drawings, 2D CAD drawings that you can use to locate your equipment. Again, what's interesting is that within the 2D tool that you're, you're locating your equipment is each of the components that you drop in is live. So you can actually click on it and get information associated with that specific piece of equipment as you're going through and doing your layout. They're also able to pull in 3D CAD drawings, but it has to be converted over to, to 3DS Max files and then brought into their tool to be able to, to trace on top of it. And so again, some of the things that they're able to do is they can do cable pathing automatically and they can also represent that and they can represent a lot of it massively and, and the connectivity between the different tools. And so and they also have a massive library of equipment, over 70,000 different entries that you can be able to pull from. And they have a dedicated team to add more stuff to it as, as they, uh, if, you know, if it doesn't exist. And so. And should have put a fast forward button on this guy. <laughs> So, and then something else that's really unique is with their racks, 
they can show it in 2D and 3D, but they can actually take those racks and ex export out the rack elevations to Excel 2, which I think is pretty cool. They can do the front and the back associated with it. And so, and then also with their, uh, with iTrax, you have lots of different information associated with pieces of equipment. You can look at the temperatures, you can create your own dashboards. And so you can go through and really kind of interrogate what's, in, what's happening from an operational standpoint of view. And so, and so again, here we're just looking at uh, the same type of thing, looking at the connectivity on a bigger, they use one of their models to show it on a, a bigger scale. So we have the cable pass connecting to the, to the PDUs and then going out to the storage racks and then throughout the rest of the, the like uh, as all said, the whole uh, facility. And you're able to pull that information together and aggregate it and look at it from a systematic standpoint of view. And there's one part that I really want to get to is where they show the, the lines or their line charts and documentation. So again, we can do the, the dashboards, but within the dashboards, they're able to, unlike many of other tools, they're able to represent lots of different data associated with the different pieces of equipment and massive amounts of it. So most tools tend to kind of crap out around 10,000 data points. These guys can go up into tens of thousands of it, and then they're able to tie into OSI SoftPy so, and, to, and if you use those guys, you're able to take what they have and look at it even to millions of data points. And so with very little lag and, um, and, and yeah, with very little lag. Again, what these guys, with the whole, what, every, what they're able to do too, is they're able to take all their data from their, their line charts and into the tabular part and export it out to Excel. Um, many of the tools that that do that are a pain. So if you have to work with ALC, BFS controls, and you want to extract out all that data, you generally have to go through and click on each individual one to be, and then download the files and be able to, to utilize that. These guys, what you're able to do is export out on a batch scale all of the data to either Excel or to other different formats. And they tie into lots of other uh, different tools so that you can you know, figure out what's going on. And then what's also nice is they have different uh, plugins associated with the um, with web servers, and they can aggregate data from lots of different sources, and you can utilize that to pull data in, standardize it, and then pull it into other tools like uh, Roma Analytics or Six Sigma for CFD modeling, and reducing again that having to do the manual entry or the the the, uh, the processing of that data. Last but not least is virtual reality. So anybody here familiar with Oculus Rift? So there's a tool from a company called Revitsto that allows you to take your BIM models, CAD drawings, and SketchUp models and pull it into their viewer so that you can collaborate with your team you know, uh, through the cloud and do markups and do coordination with that. What's really, really cool is they're able to also pull that into the Oculus Rift. So what you're seeing here is that fictitious data center uh, and I'm have a video of me kind of wandering through the data center using just the gamepad to, to see what's going on. Some of the features that they have is you're also able to send the link to other people so they can either see it in their virtual reality helmet or, or virtual reality goggles or, or just on their screen. Their, their, their screen interface is actually pretty slick too. Um, and so after the presentation, if anybody can tell me what those colors mean, your round of drinks are going to be on me. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's incredible to be able to go through and actually be inside of your data center. And one of the key aspects of their tool that makes it useful for data flow is they're able to pull in from Revit the color filters or the 3D models with color filtering. If you have color filters within your Revit model, you can again link data from Romanet, Six Sigma, or wherever, or for silly asset management, and then represent it using false colors or other way, you know, have pop-ups and things like that so that you can see it. It takes a little bit of effort, but it's, it, yeah, it works. Some of the other things that they have is, again, you can do the markups. And so in the virtual world, if you click on that model or on that markup, you, you automatically show up there. And then you can look around and then share or make modifications to it. They link some of the information back into Revit or into Navisworks or into AutoCAD so that you can pass information there. Or if something happens there, you can hit a button, link it, and update the model automatically. So this thing is there. It's, it's yeah. It's pretty cool. So the next steps is that we can do all this, but the problem is, is you have to basically have a black belt in engineering to make it all work. It's, it takes 
per project, it takes an infinite amount, of, or not an infinite amount, but a lot of time to go through and figure out how are you going to get the data flow, mapping it between the different tools, figuring out what parameters you're going to use to name the, you know, the flows of data. There's some standards out there, like there's the National BIM standard that has you know, their share parameters named, but as soon as you throw in operations, it goes out the window. It's not useful. So the next steps is, as a group, we have to go through, define the share parameters that we want to use so that you don't have to be a black belt and, and build everything up yourself. We need to go through and define the, and map the data between all the tools so that it's clear, so that you can hand it off to somebody else, they can do it, and they're not dependent on you having to be the, the one that's the source of the data. Uh, libraries, with the exception of iTrax, most of the libraries are pretty lacking. And so, again, if you're an analyst or in design, if you're having to go through and build each of the individual components and rather or whatever tools, because what's out there isn't very good, it's going to kill you from a productivity standpoint of view. We get that stuff built, it happens a lot faster. Lag is a, a pain, especially in virtual reality. When you're looking at uh, on your models on a screen and it lags a little bit, it's not that big of a deal. If you're in virtual reality, there's a good chance you'll puke. So we have to go through and figure out what we're going to do to keep that from happening. And it's part with Revitsto that makes the plugin for being able to pull into virtual reality. They have a little bit of work to do on their end. But also, us analysts and, and the people that use the Revit models, we need to help the vendors to build their models in a way that makes it so that it works. Oftentimes, those models are built in ways that look good, but will cripple the performance of your model. And then last but not least is locomotion. If you guys notice in the, the VR model, it was kind of weird going through. And so using a gamepad and like a mouse and keyboard when you got you know, the world stuck to your face uh, doesn't work so well. And so, but what's really cool is that recently the gaming industry has finally figured that out. So, so anybody played with Oculus Rift at all? Oh, once, just go one. Okay, well, there's a game called Sorrento, and this is where this is PG-13. And so this game, where they finally nailed the locomotion. They use it to slow down time, so you can jump up in the air and cap a bunch of ninjas and stuff like that with your guns, and you can run across the walls, and it doesn't make you puke. And so that's a really, really big deal. So for us, we need to challenge Revitsto to give us the same thing for engineers, and analysts, and designers in the, the building industry. And so with that, thank you. Right. Questions? Questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With um, a lot of data input, right, and you're trying to fix that problem, what yes. uh, sort of data validation tools are you using to do that? Like, what are some of the best practices or procedures you recommend? Oh, I'm so not sure. What if we make a mistake, right, and then we have 17 different softwares that are all integrated reporting on it? Uh, I'd like, it, at each of the different hands off between the tools, I generally like to have checkpoints there. But honestly, what I've seen has happened in the past is it, it just, you wait till it gets to construction, it gets messed up. And so, it, again, I do like to have like, like spreadsheets or other ways to be able to kind of, to check for that. Um, and one of my favorites is with an Excel, I'll turn it to cell red if it doesn't have the right, you know, the right data in there. But right now, it's generally up to the designer or the analyst or whoever's doing it to, to do their own work. And so, um, but good point, we definitely should figure that out. Additional answer to that question as well. Um, that's on the kind of static flow data between as, as you're putting, you know, building these things up from the beginning. When you get into the um, the more automated flow of data into these tools, one of the things we've done is um, put some. We've developed some machine learning capability on the data ingest side of our platform that basically does things um, like, I mean, some really simple stuff initially, things like outlier detection. So as, as you're getting data streaming in, it's not just coming in and skewing everything on the other end. You've got something up front that's doing some validation of data. And it's quite interesting because when we, when we started down this, down this route, we expected that a lot of the data coming out of real-time systems um, would be high-quality data. Um, you know, some of it's being driven by, you know, high quality instrumentation points. Turns out that it's not as high quality as we expected. I think we expected it to be, you know, 90% good data, 10% bad. I think we probably found it's more like 60% good data, 40% bad. So we actually developed those tools out of necessity because, you know, a lot of that garbage data 
was just throwing the system wild, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So there's still work to be done there, and, and I think it's a slightly different challenge dealing with it when you're perhaps validating, if you're looking at a Revit model and you're validating um, data that's come off essentially a single line drawing that's been, you know, put into, uh, into a model versus having to do it on the fly when you've got, you know, data um, streaming between different systems. So any other questions? Yeah, I'll ask, you know, I think a, uh, all these uh, smooth handoffs and no loss of data is the holy grail of, of large complex projects. Yeah. Has, uh, is there any good, you know, you know, there have been a lot of improvement of tools. Is there any data on, you know, uh, speed of projects, uh, less errors, things like that? Is, I don't know if Autodesk publishes anything like that or what have you, you uh, know, over the past 10 years, you know, you can do a complex project, uh, you know. 20% faster because of less, the, I wonder if that exists, I don't know. They talk about a lot. Autodesk likes to push BIM, and so do I. I think BIM is amazing compared to, to AutoCAD. Um, but a lot of the numbers are, like that first chart that we showed in the beginning was yeah. their representation of that happening. And the first one they showed BIM not losing any data whatsoever. It's crap. <laughs> I make my living off those losses of data and because you, you guys don't like to deal with it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'd, I'd look at some of the design build firms. I could find that data for you, oh, if you like. Sure. Yeah, so. Sure. So the question is, what's the correlation between the CFD model and the energy models and the, the analytical models for Romanet, correct? So they actually kind of go hand in hand. So CFD is great for looking at a snapshot of what's happening and kind of understanding how your equipment's performing and how the airflow is going through and impacting it from an instantaneous point of view. They can do transitional stuff, but it's, it's too complicated. What you can do is you can take that information and then use it to calibrate your analytical model that does it for an annual period so that you can figure out what your energy use could be. Correlation-wise, um, the dirty secrets, you can make it whatever you want. I mean, most of these tools. Yes. It's, well, you want to use that data if you do have it. If you have real data coming from the equipment, that's, you know, real time, it's obviously a lot better. You're going to use CFD if you're going to do troubleshooting. So you take that same data, you would put it into your CFD model if you can and then use that to calibrate it and get a baseline. And then if you're going to go through and look at, you have an area where you're getting hot spots, or maybe you want to squeak out another one or 2% of your capacity and you're just trying to eke it up a little bit more, you use the CFD models to kind of do the what ifs to see if it's going to go wrong. Because 1% you know, capacity is great uh, unless you burn things up, so. Yeah, I was going to add to that um, and say as well that the, um, like CFD, um, we also have a what if uh, analysis tool. So it's, it's what, on the one hand taking the real data from the system and using that to understand what's happening and then make changes is, is good, but generally people don't like messing around in the live data center without having some idea of what the impact is going to be. So both the CFD um, tools have the capability and some of the analysis tools we have as well have the capability of taking essentially a a download of the live running state of the data center, putting it into a what if state, making the changes, seeing what the impacts are, um, and then going ahead and making the change based on some knowledge of what you believe uh, that the impact's going to be. As, a, as an example, I just caught the end of uh, Rob's previous presentation um, where, where someone was talking about the, uh, you know, diff dealing, with, deal dealing with different cooling loads and, and you know, requ air requirements for different servers in, in uh, a kind of mixed environment. And uh, not to say you were wrong, Rob, but one of the solutions there is was the containment. And, and that is, that's kind of the default answer is, you know, contain the inlet. But we've seen from a lot of the, the actual real data analysis that even in a, in a contained, a very well contained environment, you will still get um, differences in inlet temperature. You will still get pressure differences you know, even in a fairly small uh, contained cold aisle, for example. Um, so there is a lot of complexity in, in apparently quite simple systems, particularly the, the more modern designs. 
Um, so I think both the analytics of the live data and the what-if capability of some of these predictive models is just helpful um, in trying to get to the bottom of some of those issues. Any more questions? Good. Thank you. Hi, Thank you.